Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Nevin Gusak, your host of the Politically Homeless podcast. With me is my guest, uh, Jeff uh, Nyquist. He is a ge- geopolitical analyst and prolific author who specializes uh, on the issues of Russian and Chinese uh, grand strategy against the United States and the rest of the West and the free world. Uh, he His writings are available on Amazon.com as well as used book finders. You can locate them on bookfinder.com. Uh, he is also has a blog, as I mentioned before, at J.R. Nyquist's blog. Uh, welcome, Jeff, back to our program. Thank you for having me, Nevin. You're very welcome. Well, you're our first guest on our rechristened program. That was the Populist Patriot. I gave a brief explanation on why I changed the name. Um, my ideas personally haven't changed much, but I figured that would describe me best. One of my commenters actually said, who's also a fan of yours, Jeff's, called me use the term which I looked up political atheist. And that probably actually defines me even better than politically homeless. Political uh, atheist. Yes, yes. Even though personally I'm not an atheist, I believe a- in God. atheist means don't you don't believe in God. <laughs> so there's exactly. no political That's God. I didn't name it. <laughs> no political God. Uh yeah. It will, it's actually a term, I've looked it up on online dictionaries, including the Urban Dictionary, and it indicates uh, you just don't believe any of the major political party orthodoxies and you don't trust, uh, you know, the special interest control politicians. So I kind of, and you have your own ideas, you take a little bit from various ideas and blend it into your own. And that's what that is. And I think that describes me best at this point. Well, and, and you know, if you know how the sausage is made, you may not be so keen on eating it, right? Yeah, correct. I've seen it like you in Washington, D.C., and I work for the Coalition for a Prosperous America. And many of your supposedly conservative Republicans, they would like to say that they hate Obama, but they actually, particularly on issues related to free trade and even domestic policy, they liked Obama more than they admitted. And that's what one of, I believe it was a House or Senate aide had said, particularly on trade. Um, so that was very telling, uh, if you will, on how well, the, the sense- they would have liked Karl Marx on free trade too. He was for it. Yes, he was. And the Soviets also, um, you know, were the Soviets and the Nazis, even though they were very selectively autarkic, they also used quote free trade, uh, to dump products into the West. And in the case of the Soviet Union, not to digress from our topics today, there was a former uh, official, might have been a vice president uh, of Amtorg, which was the old Soviet American trading company right. based in New York City. His name is Basil Del- Delgas, and he testified in 1930 um, that the reason why the Soviets were dumping vast quantities of raw materials, grain, as well as also uh, some manufactured articles like, uh, I guess, steel in the West is because in part to get hard currency very quickly, uh, even during the Great Depression, but also to create chaos in the West when you dump products in the West, uh, in Western economies, particularly ones that are industrialized, have diverse economies, or even strong labor unions and labor protections, which I on this show support very strongly to a degree. Uh, that causes businesses to not only lose money, but to fold. They can't compete. And we have experienced that with China uh, for the past 30 to 40 years since we started to accumulate trade deficits with Red China back in 1983. So I thought that was very interesting. And you have to wonder, of course, and we'll segue it into our topics, uh, what the Politburo's and Ch- of the Communist Party of China are strategizing specifically if China ever throws off Communist Party rule. It'll be very interesting to page through the documents and see what their strategic plans were, if a new government in China would even allow uh, independent scholars to do that. And the same thing if Russia became a truly free nation state as well, to for us to really go into the archives and just really pour through the documents. Um, I have my own opinions. I think 
powerful elements within the free world will try and spike that information because it will be extremely embarrassing. We, well, we know that in the case of Vladimir Bukowski's uh, book, uh, uh, which is um, Judgment in Moscow, and um, that book was spiked. And of course, a lot of that book was based on documents that Bukowski had stolen from the Soviet Communist Party archive. Um, and of course, people in the West, particularly in the United States, didn't want that book published. And for 20 years, uh, more than 20 years, that book's publication was prevented. And um, because it had Politburo minutes and references to Western, it named names, it referred to Western senators and people who had basically been supportive of the Soviet Union um, uh, on the sly, so to speak. Yeah, quite a few people, including ones that have become president, too, as well. Not to digress, Joe Biden, Senator Ted Kennedy. Right. Uh, uh, who is that guy that was with Biden, who is a sort of establishment Republican senator? He's from Indiana originally. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, oh, Richard or Richard Luger. Or Richard Dick Luger. Luger. Yes, Richard Luger is one of the uh, might have been Dick usual Luger. suspects. Yes. You know. So, yeah, yeah, I think it might have been Dick Luger. If there's anybody in the audience who is even more knowledgeable than us or as knowledgeable, a correction, that please correct us if I'm wrong, because I don't want to unjustly besmirch people, even, especially when they're deceased deceased or not deceased. Well, uh, yeah, the question of, of being friendly towards the Soviet Union, of course, is a, is a strange one, because... Uh, you can say, well, they're merely uh, seeking a solution to the Cold War. They're looking for peace. And that people that want conflict are hawks versus doves, and that the hawks are kind of bad guys who don't want to try peace, don't want to give peace a chance, so to speak. So you have that narrative. Um, but it, it is, uh, it's got more dimensions than that to it. Not it has same. many dimensions. It has many dimensions. And one thing that's really disturbing me, and as I explained on my um, Welcome Back uh, podcast, a brief live stream that I did a few days ago, it's what is really, really, really concerning me is how your MAGA Republicans, which, or most of the pro, the Putin Republicans, I, I mean, I don't know what I want to call them. Mm -hmm. I don't play fast and loose with terms, but there is this complete blindness of large swaths of the Trump influenced Republican Party. And I have different reasons, in my view, why that has occurred. Um, but it's deeply disturbing because they have the views that we can separate Russia from China, just like what we tried to do starting in the, the Nixon administration with China and the Soviet Union, with us exaggerating the depth of the split between Beijing and Moscow. My concern, Jeff, is, is that look where that's got us. We took the split at face value, or we exaggerated the nature and the extent of the split, which is what I believe at bare minimum, and look where that's got us. It's mm -hmm. got us dangerously dependent on a communist dictatorship uh, that has, from day one of the Chinese Communist Party's foundation in 1921, sought to overthrow global capitalism and liberal forms of government, uh, and also their opponents in the left, too, social democracy, I might add, and basically create one big planetary concentration camp. That's what Bolshevism, Marxism, Leninism, whatever term you want to call it, that's what it is. They want to create the world in one big freaking concentration camp. That's what it is, as far as yeah. I'm concerned. We have no, that's, that's a, so, that is absolutely correct. Um, in fact, I, my most recent essay is on the S word, a polemic. Um, and the S word is socialism. And I, I learned about the S word being the S word from a Derek Shearer uh, more than 40 years ago when I was an undergraduate at UC Irvine. Uh, I met Derek Shearer. He had come to the campus to speak. I had no intention to listening to him, but I had two, uh, you could say, uh, commie friends, socialist friends who I played chess with mm -hmm. uh, and go. 
the the uh, uh, it's a favored game in Japan, a strategy game played with stones. Uh, and I was I was they didn't I came to Jack's office, my friend Jack, to play Go, and he didn't want to play. He wanted to go l- listen to Derek Shearer. You're a political science major. You should come and hear this. So Derek Shearer was talking about economic democracy. And I listened. As I listened, I realized that there was no, I couldn't understand what the difference between economic democracy and socialism and communism was. So I, there was only like four of us that came to see him, two of my friends and this oriental lady I took to be either Chinese or Vietnamese sitting to my right. And uh, I went on the stage and I, and I asked, uh, I asked Mr. Shearer, you know, well, what's the difference between your economic democracy and socialism and capitalism? I mean, socialism and communism. And he kind of looked at me and he looked at who I was with and he said, well, I probably shouldn't say this, but there is no difference, right? So why are you using the word? Well, we don't want to use the S word, socialism, because it scares Americans. So we have to use other words to talk about it. Um, and this is the first time I heard the idea that we want to elect, we want to take over the Democratic Party, and we want to elect a stealth socialist president. And I heard the same thing from a lecture from a Marxist-Leninist saying the Communist Party was taking over the Democratic Party. This is I heard this in 1983 when I first went to graduate uh, school to get a teaching credential. I heard the same thing from this Marxist Leninist saying, we're taking over the Democratic Party through its left wing to elect a stealth communist president. Mm. And that there's going to be an economic crisis in the future and we're going to nationalize everything and run it like Lenin said, run it like the post office. Um, and that's that's just a synopsis of, of course, the the thing that I that I got a chance to uh, hear. In my, so I heard it from two sources. One who Derek Shearer was a friend of Bill Clinton's, uh, who I didn't even know who that was back in 1981. And the other one was, of course, from a an out and out communist uh, party member and leader and organizer um, in 83. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of. How they organize, what their plan is for taking things over, and and of course what you're ta- what you're mentioning is a concentration camp for the whole planet. This is this is what happens when they take over a country. They create a giant uh, police state, and when they take over the world, I think it will be worse because the only thing that modified the police states in China and Russia is the outside world. That they that they felt they needed the outside world. They had to interact with the outside world. But if it was just them, their world, they would have killed and killed and oppressed and oppressed until they had collapsed their own society. I think it would be the reduction of human civilization down to some earlier barbaric era eventually if we have a global communist system. Well, maybe even worse than that, to be honest with you, because there, don't forget, there's the uh, intersection of modern technology and we have evolved tremendously since the early dark ages and with the uh, onset and development of modern science and technology, they, the party bosses in each country or in some globalized communist or socialist police state, um, they will use that, um, <laughs> they will use that very ruthlessly against people. Let's just put it that well, way. we've seen that and already. They, yeah. Whatever. I think Galitzin, when he wrote, and um, I believe he predicted a new lies for old in a global communist police state, I mean, he predicted just a mass class based genocide. And might I add, communist parties, when they're in power, are not only ruthless for, with the class enemies, which they'll make exceptions to because they'll use them. In, in their first years of power and then selectively get rid of them when they outweigh the usefulness. The one thing that's not always known or really talked about is how also the communists absolutely ruthlessly suppresses labor strikes from the early, starting in 19, um, what was it, in 1918, Lenin's Bolsheviks were were very ruthless in suppressing strikes. 
and uh, and peasants like in the Tambov province to the point of using chemical weapons. I mean, this is what we're dealing with here. Yeah. Um, you know, and my concern, and I want to get your thoughts. I want you. We can discuss your essay on uh, the socialism. Uh, but I also want to get your thoughts. Why are we asleep here, and why is the Republican Party, particularly the, it used to be the free trade Republicans, and still many of them are not great uh, on Russia because they're very contradictory. But to me, the MAGA, the quote unquote MAGA Republicans, are the ones that are in total denial that Russia is the threat to the United States. You've gotten all kinds of grief from them, including you've referenced it in one of your recent essays about a religious conservative. On this show, you can name names if you want. If you don't, no, you, no, he's a he's a, a private respectful. private person. He's not a he's not a media person. He's a private person who I've known for some years. Oh, okay. Um, but okay. but it 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 you know yeah uh, becoming pro Russian and you know saying there is you know it's telling me that I should not use the word communist in my writings or in my talking to people because really communism has been defeated and it doesn't really exist anywhere and there isn't really a communist threat and if i use the word communism people won't understand what i'm talking about they'll think i'm a i'm a cold war dinosaur um and there's a there's a basic disconnect because there's people think a very oddly people's ideas they think in ideal types capitalism communism you know and and these ideal types don't exist in reality right that is that there's no free market in this in the libertarian sense there's never been one because there's always been people with guns people with the ability to interfere in market processes and um and so uh, uh, so no market is without the introduction of the use of force because people are armed. So there's never been a free market because people everywhere carry around weapons. There's, there's political entities and they have laws and they have restrictions on trade or they have blockades or what, what have you. So there's never been this, you know, uh, perfect, this, this free economy this for, or free trade for that matter. They don't exist in real life. Just like there's no socialist utopia. Utopia is actually a, the word for nowhere, right? And, and so you to, th there is no such uh, collective ownership of everything where it's all equal. That cannot exist just in the same sense that a free market, a perfect free market, an ideal free market can't exist. So what we're dealing with when we talk about reality is we talk about entities that are uh, that have all kinds of elements, complex elements, which can be each of these elements can be described in terms of an ideal type, but they are not those ideal types. And this is where people, very simple people, get all confused when they use terms like democracy and freedom and and so on. The, these these ideas or ideal type concepts aren't really what we find when we look at reality. When we look at a so-called democracy like the United States, we don't find it's very democratic and we're shocked, right? We find oligarchy and stratification everywhere thinking that's a bad thing. Well, there's actually reasons for that, that if you don't have oligarchy, you have anarchy. And anarchy is not very good either. But yet there's no perfect order. There's also elements of anarchy in all countries and systems. So there's not a, such a thing as perfect government control. So you have all these concepts, which we imagine perfectly in our mind, oh, they have absolute control. No, even in the Soviet Union or communist China, there's no absolute control. Although there's a lot more control than there is like in Mexico, or you know, there's a country that is much closer to anarchy, right? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good explanation. It kind of, somewhat dovetails with my political homelessness or political atheism and whatnot. Um, yeah, there is no such thing as a perfectly capitalist or communist system. There's also many different flavors of capitalism and schools of thought. That's right. Uh, 
you know, we have to also understand that there are many different flavors of socialism. Uh, in my book, the negative ones are, you know, for example, national socialism versus communism. The, yes, they're both collectivists. They both emphasize in theoretically an organic community, whether on a global basis or a national basis. Uh, historically, that has translated into unaccountable government bloodshed and totalitarian. And, and that is that is the real key thing uh, that it that. You know, James Burnham famously once said, politics is about three things. It's about power, power, and power. Max Weber said, it is the question of, of not, it is not a question of everybody sharing power. It's a question of what kind of elite you're going to have. Who is going to be your ruling elite? And then we have this confusion over the political system and the economic system. Because, uh, an economic system, we, we refer to capitalism and we think of an economic system, but that's not a political system, right? We, so we, the, the political system and the economic system, those, there's two different dimensions here that people get confused. So they'll say like China, oh, China's not a communist country because they have private property in China. Well, of course, even in Marxist theory, uh, you're going to have private property. Uh, it's going to take... Uh, Years and years, Marx once said, it's 50 years of civil war before you can achieve, you know, real communism in a country. So, so you have this, uh, the, they're supposedly building towards communism by going through socialism, or sometimes they call it market socialism, sometimes they call it state capitalism. They're not very consistent in the way they describe their own system over the years. But, but, but you, you have this economic system and they say, well, China's not really communist but yet it is the political system is ruled by the Communist Party, which has communism as its goal of creating in its economic system, which it never actually creates, but it just creates a, a variant of controlled capitalism out of Beijing. Right. So the reality, it's interesting, you have the theory or the theories or the slogans or the ideas that people carry in their heads, and then there's the reality. And what's the, the real problem with when, whenever we talk about politics is that our language is like some kind of goofy fairy tale language. We have a fairy tale way of talking about politics in which we use all these words that have no relationship to their actual reality on the ground. So that, you, you know, after a while, I get, I, get, I get to listening to people. Once I hear their ideology, once I hear those ideal types brimming up in their mind, I have to turn them off because it's all nonsense. They're just talking nonsense because they're not, their concepts and their way of talking does not actually reflect any of the realities. Yeah, and not only that also, um, well, I wanted to prefer make my point and comment uh, a little joke. Uh, what is a market socialist? A socialist that's run out of hard currency. There you go. Yeah, that's a good. But there's a lot of truth to that because, you know, they'll all of a sudden adopt certain private market mechanisms in order to attract money and also to attract a larger strategic goal, which is to say, to say, hey, look, we're changing. We're not a threat anymore. You can do business with right. us, more business with us and everything else. So hence the joke. But yeah, um, there's another uh, Ideology is also very profitable, and you and I have dealt with conservative and libertarian organizations and personalities in varying degrees. And behind this commitment to ideology, and through my study as well academically, people make a lot of money when you start shilling for libertarian and so-called conservative causes. There's a lot of money to make, like in the Heritage Foundation, like the Club for Growth, like the Cato Institute, and others where you have large deep pocketed donors that ha know that what the truth is, they know, are acutely aware how horrific Beijing and Moscow are and were, and other dictatorships that are aligned with Russia and China throughout the decades or almost a century, uh, they just don't care. They're looking from a perspective, and I've studied particularly the financial capital elites in the United States as they, uh, over the decades. And, you know, it's what the journalist uh, Matt Taibbi, who is on the left, he calls them archipelago men and women. These are people that have no real connection to the community, to the country. 
There was a tell-all article in the New York Times by a former hedge fund manager, James Polk, I believe. I've quoted him often in the in my podcasts and in my books. And it talks about they're just become a fireball of greed. And that's when you have these individuals controlling your intellectual output and donating to your causes, that's going to corrupt your scholarship and that's going to tremendously corrupt political decision making. And yeah. the fascinating thing is the Russians and the Chinese explicitly know it. I can read quotes off the screen from primary source documents, defectors, Lenin's archives, as written by Yuri Anakov, who was always an archivist and artist in the early Soviet Union that was supposedly allowed to see Lenin's notes, and he took notes of it. Um, the communists are very brilliant. So are the National Socialists in their years to gain power, and they make detailed studies of these personalities, and the goal is eventually just to kill them. But uh, along the way, they want to pave the way and use every weakness in American society and Western society and just use it to decompose us and ultimately destroy us. Yeah, this, now that, this, that's an important point. This, uh, is, this is where I agree, before you continue, this is where yeah. I agree with Russell Kirk and you, uh, too, on the need for a certain type of moral compass in our upper classes in American society, in American society, our governing classes, our business classes. Russell Kirk talked about we need, quote, more genuinely educated trade union leaders and business leaders in this country. So I agree with the both of you. So as you were saying, go ahead. I just want to insert that. Yeah. Well, of course, the, the point is, you said to disintegrate our society. Um, communism is, um, if you, uh, um, I didn't quote him in my essay, but uh, an important writer on socialism uh, is uh, Igor Shafarovich, who wrote the, a book on socialism. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote the introduction to the book. And he basically, he says, well, let's look at the real thing. Let's look at the theories. In the ancient world, you had Plato and you had other writers talking about having, they actually outlined Chileastic uh, communism. And it, it's a vision of a future society or a, a, an ideal society where everything's held in common, wives and all property. And uh, you, you have the society is kind of stratified where the intellectuals, Plato called them the philosophers, right, were in charge. Well, we, we see that, uh, that uh, Lenin was an intellectual, Marx was an intellectual, Mao was an intellectual, Hitler was actually an intellectual, he was sort of an um, autodidact type of an intellectual. Um, <clears throat> these hyper-intellectuals uh, end up ruling a society with these, these concepts, these socialist concepts. Hitler was a socialist, Mao, Stalin and, uh, Stalin, and so on. They were socialists, and they, they, they have this. It's a very, it's structured. This dream of how society ought to be is structured. And what's interesting, if you go to Plato's Republic, the intellectuals or the philosophers who rule everybody, uh, the other classes, the guardians, which are the soldiers who defend society, and then you've got the the people who actually work and make things. Below that. Um, they're severely punished for lying <laughs> in Plato's Republic. But the philosophers who rule, they have to make up a noble lie. They're allowed to lie. They're given permission to lie. Does that sound familiar? You look at the Soviet Union, you look at China, the lie. And, and of course, they also, it turns out, they also have to murder people who don't want to go, go along with this rigid rules of how things are going to be. Because if you... If you take private property away from people, you have to strictly police them, right? Because what happens if they decide they're going to steal from the common, you know, stockpiles of whatever? Right. right. Well, let's take an extreme example. And I encourage people to research the People's Temple of Jim Jones, the so-called Reverend Jim Jones. And he was a believer in Marxism-Leninism to the hilt. I'm not going to do a lecture on him right now. And when you were making a description of property held in common, including wives, that's what happened in the People's Temple. And that was a highly abusive, corrupt dictatorship. 
Um, you know, when you have governments that uh, in the other extreme that completely suppress private property or, or exhibit such a scientific tight totalitarian control over private property, which occurred in Nazi Germany and fascist Italy and their allies, including wartime Japan during the 1930s and 19, part of the 1940s, um, what is the end product? It's, it's, it's history. You just look at it. You get an extreme amount of corruption. You get police state abuses, extermination camps uh, on industrial levels. Uh, you get hyper-militaristic uh, conquests to various degrees, as well as plans to possibly be ultimately implemented to smash every free country, whether mildly left or mildly right or somewhere in the center, um, you know, and massive genocide. So that's what the historical end product is. I don't see why it's controversial. But getting back to the communism is dead thing with in relation to Russia and Ukraine, it's the communists themselves, for whatever reason, we can debate it, but I think they're being truthful to a degree when they say it. Like Gloria Lariva, for example, who uh, used to be involved with the Workers' World Party, now she's with the uh, Party of Socialism and Liberation as, as a splinter communist group from the Workers' World Party. And she said a few years ago during the Trump administration that the fog of anti-communism is lifting. Uh, um, that was basically her quote, almost verbatim her terminology. You even had in the late 1980s, you had Gus Hall, for example, saying that the appeal of communism was increasing, that now that uh, the uh, Soviet Union, the Communist Party, we can talk about it in a more laid back way. Um, and he estimated then the party being about 20,000 regular members and 250,000 sympathizers. And he gave that uh, interviewed in New York Times, I believe, in 1988 or 1989. Um, now, the Communist Party USA totals about 5,000 people. We don't know how many secret members they have. The Democratic Socialists of America, which has a openly, it's called the Communist Caucus, they have 50 to 60,000 people, and they are very, very aggressive into making entree into the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, unfortunately. Uh, you have the Workers' World Party, you have PSL, you have the Party of, Communi uh, Party of Communists USA, which is a splinter group from the CPUSA. We don't know the estimates and how many members that they have. I've seen with the Workers' World Party about a 300 or 400 activists in the United States, and people might be like big deal. And I think where you have analysts on the right and certainly on the left that tend to belittle the notion that the Cold War has continued, or they actually they would belittle whether we even had a Cold War during the Cold War. Um, yeah, they were belittling the Cold War as 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 uh, as the as merely something inspired by the military industrial complex that just wanted to make money. That's exactly it. That's what much of the far left engaged in. My concern is you know, Lenin reputedly said, give me a handful of, revolution handful of revolutionaries and I can overturn the world or something or another. Mm -hmm. Where Bolshev where Russia in 1917 had a population of 91 million people and the number of Bolshevik activists were 250,000 people. Mm -hmm. And I look at that and I say, or it might've been 200,000. Um, and I look at it and I say, if our country is in severe crisis, and if you have properly motivated revolutionaries, and ones that are very skilled at political subversion and taking advantage of legitimate grievances, they can make a huge impact. They certainly did in Russia during extreme unrest, during a crisis situation in Russia, which involved massive defeats on the Western Front during World War I, as well as also a highly incompetent government, which unfortunately the provisional government of Alexander Kerensky was not a man of the right. Uh, he just, his government was just inherited an awful mess um, and just did not have the strength and power to snap his fingers and make every all the problems go away. Uh, and the Bolsheviks took advantage of that. The Bolsheviks have the advantage of being highly organized and initially their leaders were very bright, very intelligent, 
and they had uh, strategic and tactical concepts for getting what they wanted. Uh, they'd spent a lot of time, many of them in exile, and they had very well worked out theories, better theories, by the way, about how to do politics in some respects that they got to practice on once they won the revolution than they had theories about how to achieve socialism. They ended up being actually under Lenin. Lenin's great gift was he was a genius of practical politics. And um, and so was Stalin. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's how they were able to achieve it, uh, their first regime. And then you have these movements, like you say, of a few hundred thousand people in different countries, depending on the country and the size of the country, the group can be smaller. But they have their influences way out of proportion to their numbers. Exactly. And uh, and and but part of this is and Gustav Laban explained why this was more than 120 years ago. He said most people, even though they might not like the word socialism, they want it. They want things that socialism has to offer. They want that promise of utopia is in the back of people's minds thinking, oh, gee, could I be taken care of in my old age? Could I actually, uh, look, I don't like that these people have all this money. Could these people be maybe plundered a bit and it, some of it come to me? You know, maybe the rich need to be robbed for the benefit of the poor. Um, maybe I'll benefit from that. So so there's a, there's a, um, there's a secret uh, exploitation of envy. There's a secret desire for utopia and for easy solutions. And so you have this broader politics, what you, what you could call the communist movement. Jim, from Jimmy from Brooklyn makes this distinction. The communists are a small group within the larger socialist or communist movement who have the ideas that they actually can manipulate the others because they understand their motivations. And so you've got people who wanna get rid of the bomb, because they want, you know, they want peace. So you get the peace movement. You want people who want uh, the environment protected, so that can become an issue. All, all these issues, many of them legitimate issues. You know, people in 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 uh, labor unions want better a uh, deal from the their employers. Uh, many of these issues are legitimate issues, but the communists can exploit those issues to create this larger movement or coalition to go further than just these groups getting what they want, but to transform the system. As you say, break it down, break down the system. And what they're, one of the things they're breaking down is the checks and balances so that they can get their people into the centers of power without any check on that power so that they can just arbitrarily order people to do what they want, to confiscate property, to force people into, shall we say, medical treatments or economic, you know, environmental regulations that could destroy their businesses, that could create, all of it creates a justification for more concentration of power at the top once they've captured the top. And that power just gets stronger and stronger as society is strangled. Well, yeah, I mean, they're, they, you know, various extremist organizations infiltrate the government uh, in part because unlike reformists who Marxist Leninists dis dislike people that like to reform, who want to reform capitalism or, in my view, re reverse basically Reaganomics in this country and much of it has not been reversed. We want to, or at least I would like to reverse it to the the pre late 1970s and when you and I've talked to communists one of them was a friend of mine and he left the party and but he then became disillusioned with things I won't go into it now um, and he's no longer with us he was a young guy and he passed away and um, yeah there are a number of people that join the communists because they have become very disillusioned and they look at people like me who want to reverse Reaganism and globalism um, they look at us as reformists and petty bourgeois. Actually, we're worse enemies than even those on the neoliberal corporate right uh, because we want to massage out as best as possible. Of course, you can't get a perfect anything, but 
uh, massage out the kinks, so to speak, in otherwise unregulated capitalism. Uh, I used to be a believer in unregulated capitalism, and that was quite a journey of how I evolved, or maybe to some devolved on that issue. Uh, that's another story for another time. Um, but yeah, that's an issue. Um, the reason people joining extremist movements, uh, I've investigated that. Uh, there's a variety of reasons. I think many analysts are have are right and wrong on the issue. Ludwig von Mises, in his uh, short booklet, uh, The Anti-Capitalist Mentality, uh, he ascribes it to envy. Of course, Whitaker Chambers argues that's argued in response that that's just no nothing conservatism to the point of view. In fact, actually, communists were actually particularly its leadership and financial experts actually are very adept at business, for example. They weren't just society's losers. Um, when you look at, um, you know, what uh, Louise Rees, who was the wife of John Rees, I know you and I have some issues with him. Uh, Igor Glogolev, who was a uh, high-level official of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, um, worked in the International Department and others who have studied this. Uh, the leaders tend to be criminals, is what they say, and very corrupt and very po uh, power hungry. Glogolev said when he interfaced with uh, men who in the West who have worked with the Soviet Union, he found them to be the worst species in humanity when he interacted with them. He had a very low opinion. Um, and then you have others who are leaders and activists. Let's take Danny Haifang, who you, who would work, uh, write for the Workers' World Party's newspaper called Workers' World. And he's a major, major booster of communist China. Not a particularly good character in that sense. But what in an interview, what led him to communism was, you know, what happened to his parents, who were lower middle class, working class, uh, working for I forget where. and you know, just lower middle class positions. And what had happened was, is that they were, became victims, so to speak, of the deregulation of Wall Street, like Glass-Steagall, the repeal of Glass-Steagall by Bill Clinton and Phil Graham. And when that happened, and that kind of selective deregulation happened at the behest of the Wall Street investment banking industry, what had happened was those protective layers, those checks and balances, which balanced and stabilized our banking system, what happened was is that in part affected homeowners and it, I could send you the interview. It's in, I also discuss it more in my latest book, Turning the Page, and that disillusioned him from capitalism. And when you read dozens and dozens of interviews, when I've talked to people, when I look at Matt Heimbach, who was the former, one of the former founders of the traditionalist workers party, uh, which is a, was a neo-Nazi outfit, and he did an interview essay where the reason why people join neo-Nazis, when I talked to Shandon Simpson, who was kicked out of the American military, he had bought some of my books, he was or is a fascist, and I asked him, why do people join neo-Nazis? And one of the reasons were economic, is because of the Reagan and Clinton era deregulations, the financializations, the mergers and the acquisitions that destroyed community businesses and whatnot where that was allowed, uh, as well as also what they felt was the increasing moral degeneracy as well as free trade. Shandon's family, many of them work for General Motors. Uh, and of course, and he's from Ohio, and they were out, the jobs were outsourced. And I think what we have to do, and I know, I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, but I, I know it worked in Germany to a degree under Bismarck, uh, at least had the right idea. I think you have to outflank the socialists in their arguments. I think we have to be very humble and say, you know what, they have a point and we have to meet the people's needs to a certain degree. We know we can't achieve utopia, obviously that's impossible on any end. We all know that. Um, but we have to look at really what works policy-wise and do the best we can because plutocracy is horrible, there's no doubt about it. But what would come after plutocracy, let's say the world of national socialism or communism or Islamism is a hundred times worse. And that's my concern. Um, so there are many reasons why people become communists, they become neo-Nazis. Uh, 
and we have to be better listeners and more honest intellectually and really be motivated. And this is where your arguments have come into play, which I think are very valuable. We need a new ethic and leadership in this country. I mean, what have been your, uh, you've dealt with uh, politicians and so-called conservatives. I don't like calling them conservatives. What are they like as people? What do you think makes them tick? Ambition. You've tried to propound your message on well, the Well, ambition on is a basic, look, um, ambition is something that, um, the ambition to have power or have money it, it's it's good to have a, the right kind of ambition, but that exactly. being motivated for the wrong things uh, shows a kind of problem in the soul. Uh, you were talking about the reasons why people become extremists, why they become Nazis or communists, national socialists or international socialists. Um, it, it is uh, Eric Verglin, I think, had the most comprehensive explanation it is alienation mm-hmm. and alienation has two senses that uh, you're you're you are you find that society is not and and the economy and the system is not your cup of tea but but really alienation is also uh, a maladjustment to reality uh they used to call psychiatrists alienists in the 19th century and part of the idea is that they're alienated from reality. They're alienated from themselves, from their true self. That's called narcissism, by the way. They're alienated from God, the ultimate reality, which many people don't agree exists. And they're alienated from the the system, as I said before. So you, you have the circle of alienation. Eric Verglin said, this is not a psychological problem, he he preferred the term uh, pneumopathology or spiritual sickness, right? Pneumopathology just is, means spiritual sickness. And then he used Karl Marx as the example of an of a of what happens in a spiritually sick mind. Where what's their go to? The salve for the spiritually sick uh, narcissist or or malignant. Um, uh, narcissist or a sociopath like Karl Marx, the salve is lust for power. The desire to be God, in fact, because if the world is not right and you're an atheist, the only way to make it right is to become the God of that world, right? That's the ultimate rightness. Well, and, if, if you want to play the role of God, yeah, and, and of are, course there are leaders of those movements, and, plenty of them that right. want to and do of course, that. In my opinion. The, the meaning of Plato's communism is well, Plato's a philosopher, and the philosophers get to be God. And in Karl Marx uh, and and Lenin's uh, philosophy, the uh, proletariat working class makes the revolution, but it's the vanguard, the intellectuals, who guide the working class to their victory. So again. Uh, it it turns out to be ego aggrandizing. You get to be God. And what's interesting about socialism is, well, there's a famous story from Greek history. I believe it was the tyrant in Thebes who'd been successful for a couple decades of of being the tyrant, the absolute power in the city state of Thebes. There was an enterprising young Athenian who wanted to form a dictatorship in Athens. And he went to visit him and he said, um, What's your secret? And the uh, tyrant of Thebes didn't want to say anything. He just took a scythe and took him out to a field. He took the scythe and he went like this. He knocked all, he, he knocked the wheat down where it was all the same height. And of course, this fellow was very upset because he didn't, he just did this and he didn't. But then he was, by the time he got back home, he realized he had been given a great lesson. Mm-hmm. If I can lower everyone else to a common level of equality, that's the secret of my tyranny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So egalitarianism, social leveling, was the key to dictatorship, to tyranny in the ancient world. This was understood in ancient Greece. Mm-hmm. And of course, Karl Marx understood it perfectly well because Karl Marx was highly educated and he knew all this history. And and so... Uh, in order to empower, super empower yourself, you disempower everyone else. 
There are no, there's nobody above this tall. And now you're this tall above them all. You're the one that towers over them. In a normal organic society, you have, you have different orders of people who have different kinds of power and their power check each other. Uh, the classic example, the like the Lycurgian constitution in, in Sparta, which was considered a model in ancient Greece, where you have the masses of people are represented in the popular s- assembly that gets to vote and has a veto on the, the kings and the nobles. You have the Senate where you have the, the nobles. They have a vote and a veto on the people and on the kings. And you had the Spartans were so paranoid of, of authority. They had two kings, not one. And each king could veto the other one. So that they had this system of checks and balances, so that nobody could be a tyrant in their system. And so this is what the Roman constitution, they, instead of two kings, they had two elected consuls, elected every year. They had the democratic check was annual. All Nobody had a term of office more than a year um, in the Roman original Roman Republican constitution. That's a pretty short period of time. And of course, it made... It, it made the popular assemblies in the Senate more powerful, the Senate and the people of Rome, right? This is the, the a slogan of the Roman Republic. Um, so it was, it, it was part democracy, part oligarchy, part monarchy, right? The, the U.S. system, the American system has those elements. The president is the monarch. The Congress is the, uh, uh, the lower house of Congress represents the people and the Senate represents the, 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 the elite, the political elite of the various states that are represented in the Senate. The, the thing, the problem that we have with socialism is the leveling destroys organic society on purpose to aid in the concentration of power of the revolutionary um, leaders who want to form a new elite that has absolute control over society. There is this pathological motivation and this alienation, and it it harvests the alienation of people throughout society. The stories I, I want to make this point about the story about the 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 people whose whose family was injustice by some economic system. Every single system, no matter how good or, or effective that system is, there are there's going to be tragic outcomes for particular individuals in that system. That's just the way every system's going to work. In America, where we have so much opportunity and there's so much abundance, you have less of that. And if people have tragic circumstances, they're not as tragic as they are in another form of society, right? And you, your freedoms are protected and there's checks and balances. Now, your point about plutocracy and a point about socialism. Where things become worse, and the, this is my cr- critique of capitalism, so to speak. The problem with capitalism is we have, since the 19th century, eliminated all the aristocratic, organic aristocratic elements in our society. Remember, George Washington was criticized as a high-flying aristocrat in his day. Yes. And he and the founding fathers as Virginia planters had a real aristocratic, they cultivated an aristocratic ethic. And that ethic after the Civil War was gone. And then you had untrammeled capitalism, as you say. And the what was the restriction on capitalism? It was Congress, which which uh, Mark Twain joked was uh, America's uh, native criminal class, right? The nobody's wealth was safe while Congress was in session. Well, what you had is you had the ability of the wealthy to buy congressmen to buy legislation to then advance their enterprise with public money or with laws that help them. And so this is the Gilded Age. Suddenly, the the government, the Republican system, minus the aristocrats with their ethic, their high moral standards and their ethic, saying, you know, which is a separation of state and economy in their mind, which goes back to ancient Rome. Ancient Rome had laws. The Roman senators could not conduct business. They could not be uh, capitalists, right? Of course, those laws, laws broke down in the late Roman Empire. When you had people like Crassus and people like Pompey and Caesar, they broke those laws down so they could become super rich and then super powerful. But in America, the rich who were not 
uh, Roman aristocrats, right, or Roman generals. They were just entrepreneurs. They could suddenly use the political system to advance their entrepreneurship or their big business establishments, their oligopoly. The problem with that is that what they have done is they have broken the republic by doing that. Because now the republic is the servant of mammon, the servant of money, of the money-making interest. What happens then to the interest of national security, to the interest of combating, which is what the aristocrats' job was? The aristocrats in Western society were warrior aristocrats who were responsible for stopping the enemies from within the society who would overthrow it and the enemies from without that would invade it. And now suddenly, people who are mainly interested in making money are now to adjudicate the question of enmity. Enmity. So now they go, now you have communist China and Russia or Nazi Germany. And what do they want to do? They want to invest in Nazi Germany. They want to build up Hitler. They want to build up China. They're doing the same thing with China they did with Hitler. And you say, well, this is treason. This is... Um, this is a conspiracy that a lot of people like to make a conspiracy theory out of it, but no, it's very sociological. They just want to make money. This is all they know. This is all they believe in. They have bent the state in the rules of the state and they've eliminated the state's function of protecting us from our enemies, thinking that oh, our enemies want to make money too. mirror imaging thinking, oh, well, they don't really, Hitler doesn't really believe that stuff about the Jews and socialism. And Stalin is really a guy we can do. Or they just don't with. care. Or they, I think many of them, well, don't, many of them don't care well, because hold they're. Hold on, don't, don't sell them short. They, they oh, do, <laughs> they, no, they, they, they would care if they could understand anything outside their economic thinking. You see, when your mind reduces everything to a question of making money, the rest of the, these other questions don't even exist for them. And when they, when they see that communists, and this is how the communists really fool them, when they see that communists are ready to jump into business with them, they go, ah, they're not really communists, they're hypocrites. And that means that we, that we can do business with them because they're hypocrites. They don't really believe in their ideals. They're just dirty politicians who are trying to get ahead and they want to make as money as anyone else. And we can buy them. We can buy Stalin. We can buy the Chinese politicians. We can. But the problem is they're psychopaths who want to destroy and have absolute power. And the idea that you can buy them. They're laughing at you. Oh, yeah, we'll take your money. You can build us up. We're going to get you later. We're going to shoot you. Mao gave lectures on this. There's a famous book. Um, on this um, uh, uh, called the um, the subversion of the innocents, which begins with a a uh, 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 quotations from another book by a Peruvian Maoist uh, about uh, Mao's. It was called the uh, the the um, Yinan Way. It's by Eudocio Yinan Way. Yes. Mm -hmm. by Yinan it's, Way. it's communist. Yeah, and it's about Mao's lectures about how. Fill up the capitalist pockets, make him rich. As long as he gives us the political positions that we want, we'll shoot him later. We'll, uh, we'll appropriate, we'll take his stuff away from him later. So that in in where that makes the, the capitalist uh, is guilty, the capitalist is guilty of being stupid and of committing suicide by going into business with people who intend to his destruction. So there's a wickedness in this. There's a greed and a wickedness in it. But there's also a kind of innocence in it in that he genuinely doesn't understand that they're going to kill him. Because if he understood that, he wouldn't be going into business with them. Okay? And there are capitalists who understand that. Kyle Bass is a good example. right? He gives talks about China, getting out of China, divesting from China. Oh, you so know, Roger, Roger Robinson. Robinson. Yeah, Roger, Roger Robinson. Robinson is another is a Wall Street baker that understands. So there's some of these guys that are that really do understand it. Absolutely. But as a but as a culture, a lot of the business community, it's like, oh, give me a break. They don't the Chinese aren't communists. They don't believe in communism. Because why? Because Mao said. Let's go into business with them. Let's help them make money. We don't even need the money. We just need the position from which we can hang all the capitalists. And this is what they, none of them understand. And this is the, 
This is what I call the, the paradox of capitalist system. The capitalist system leads to its own destruction because it by nature destroys the aristocratic warrior class in its, in its own leveling process in seeking this democracy, which it can dominate through money because what the aristocrats were in its way, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the pro democratic propaganda is, oh, those awful aristocrats, isn't it unfair? So the, here the, the, um, the capitalists use egalitarian de democratic ideas against the aristocracy to eliminate it and then to go directly into business with the communists who are going to destroy them because now the, the people who are supposedly gu the guardians in, in Plato's system aren't guarding anymore. They're not there because the elite consists entirely of this business, these, these, these money-making people with money in their thought. And this has also corrupted the scientific establishment. It's corrupted the defense establishment because it, it becomes about these companies getting greater, greater share and getting money. And so the whole purpose of defending the country and understanding communist subversion, it's just not convenient for them. Yeah, there's much of this I agree with. Um, and I'm going to be in my essays, which I always take my, my time writing, um, there is a large element of the business community. It may be interesting to do an academic study on that, um, of course, but there are many quotes you can find, like during the 1980s, the head of what was it, the first Chicago National Bank, or it might have been Citibank, uh, I'd have to look it up, said that, yeah, sure, we're giving loans, and for all I know, we could use, they could be using it to enrich uranium or build their intercontinental ballistic missiles, but basically, you know, we don't know, and kind of blasé about it. Uh, your time when you spoke to a political counselor, to a right-wing billionaire, and they said, sure, we know you're right, and Ladislav Bittman, who was the former head of the, for those of you in the audience who don't know what Bittman, who Bittman is, uh, former head of the Czech uh, disinformation department and the Czech intelligence service. And the well, communist, right, communist Czech intelligence invest. service. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. We all want to, you know, we know you're right, but we just want to invest in Russia and China. And many, and I know this, you know, for a fact, they're building bunkers. They know war, world war is coming. And yet they push for policies that enrich the militaristic collectivist powers. And it, Academically, it's fascinating, but as an American, and I consider myself a patriot, just like Jeff, you're very patriotic, and you and I do this for not tons of money, to say the least, but it deeply upsets me because what happens is, is you're handing power, essentially. First of all, you're really royally, I'm sorry to use the terminology, you're screwing over your own people, including the people in the country that helped make you wealthy. You didn't just do it solely on your own. People get you to the dance. And I'm a manager where I'm from, where in my, in my um, occupation, in my career. And my staff, they're a big part of why I do a decent job as a manager. Uh, secondly, and as you pointed out, their throats are going to get slipped. Eventually, you will have a mob or the Russian or Chinese People's Liberation Army, they will come and find these people and they will slit their throats. I don't mean to be graphic. Major Glitzen talks about a class genocide. Eventually you're gonna be found and they're gonna be shot on the spot. That's what it's gonna end up like. I, you know, um, and the, uh, the, the counterpoint, um, the, the, one point I wanted to add regarding Danny Haifong and Matt uh, Heimbach and others who joined DSA, Communist Party USA, uh, the Workers' World Party that become shills for China, like Danny Haifang. There is a legitimate disillusionment. Not only Virgilund talks about that, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. discusses the enemy and the disenchantment during the Depression with untrammeled capitalism, which where people get sucked into believing that there are other alternatives, even though they're monstrous police states. And and whatnot, and they choose not to see the horrors of it, or they might not know about it, or they also don't care. Um, but if you didn't have this sort of crony deregulation, the free trade, if this was kept in place, that would have minimized the need to, uh, the appeal of extremist ideologies. You know, the sociologist, I'm sure you're familiar with him, Daniel Bell actually said that 
One of the reasons why, on an economic point of view, he wrote this in 1960, why Marxism economically was not appealing is is because they abolished Gilded Age style capitalism, which is being brought back into the United States since the 1980s. So, of course, my goal is, is to put these checks and balances and keep them selectively in capitalism, restore them. But we also have to understand this is where I have a major problem with the hardcore anti-capitalists, the people whose end goal is the complete elimination of capitalism because it goes against human nature. And I know I'm not the first person that has talked about it, but let's put two and two and examine actually what the American public and many other people throughout the world. There is this natural drive within elements of the population to be entrepreneurial, to own property down to their home, a condo. Maybe at one point when I'm going to bet, you know, uh, less expenses on my plate, I might want to buy a property or two so I have intergenerational wealth and pass that on to my daughter, Emily. I possibly might do that. I don't know what my financial situation is. That is a natural human phenomenon. I think you would agree with me. Uh, that is something that should not be eliminated. And well, capitalism, well uh, I'll let me add to that. The, the reason there's why, a lot I can add, but yeah, yeah go ahead. Th- th- just w- want to add that people take care of property when it's theirs. Exactly. If it's everybody's property, no one properly takes care of it. And that's just the way it is. This is this is, by the way, this is not just human nature. Um, <clears throat> a bird with its nest takes care of its nest because its own eggs are in it. I mean, this is this is part of nature. This is a natural thing. And the thing is, is that people should not, you should not take away their motivation to have children and to make a nest and to have things. The whole reason we're the, a tool making animal human beings are. And we need our tools and we, the idea of sharing the tools, well, you just broke the tool. I want my own tool that I can take care of that other people won't plunder or pilfer or break. And in a socialist society, the tools are all broken or pilfered or plundered. And, and the, it is the honest, hardworking people in a socialist economy who are exploited. Whereas the lazy and the shirkers and the thieves, they win because they get to be able to be free riders on the labor of others. So it is a system that advantages criminals, basically. So that part of human nature loves it. So human nature does, part of human nature loves the the, the property in common and and part of it doesn't. And the thing is, is we should take the, the, what is the nobler what promotes better behavior? What promotes more efficiency? What promotes the virtues? It's property ownership promotes. I don't it. mean to be rude. Do you mind if I get some more cold water? Guys, by the way, uh, for those of you, Jeff included, I was looking at my phone on occasion because my air conditioner is broken. So speaking of landlords- And you're in Florida. You know, How hot is it there? It's, it's hot, but I have a fan and I worked out in this seat. As everyone, including you, Jeff, know, I, uh, you know, I do a lot of working out, weighing up and down 59 steps for a half an hour, up and down, walking a couple of miles four times a week. So I need my water. I'm not okay. drinking high fructose syrup beverages. I'm not doing that. So I need my water, my hydration. Okay, very good. Got to hydrate. Sorry, guys. I, I don't mean so, uh, to uh, So anyway, that uh, my idea uh, of criticizing socialism, and this is this is quite a discussion of uh, these issues, is that the problem, the reason that capitalist system is vulnerable is not just that the common people want something for nothing. Many people do. But it's also the capitalists. They want to make money by going into business with people who are they think are only um, communists in name only, and that they can make uh, m- money that way. And of course, it all uh, sort of works out that socialism has continually advanced. China has, just in the course of a year and a half, China went from having uh, 100 ICBMs to, to 450 ICBMs, right, that we now say they have. Uh, Russia has grown its uh, and modernized its strategic rocket forces with the deployment of new classes of rockets. And of course, what really troubles me is that you'd mentioned before that 
part of the point of socialism, uh, as they are alienated, there is a destructive urge in Karl Marx. Karl Marx wrote a poem in which he said that if he could be, if he could destroy creation, he'd be equal to God who made it. So there's a destructive urge there. We've seen it in the Soviet Union and China and Cambodia and the communist regimes in Africa. So now they, they really love their weapons of mass destruction. Kim Jong-un, he wants atomic weapons and ICBMs. The Chinese have built this, are building this big uh, strategic nuclear arsenal when even unrestricted warfare book says, oh, we don't want a nuclear arsenal. You read the two colonels book, unrestricted warfare. They say, oh, nuclear weapons are obsolete. We don't need nuclear weapons. Oh, lo and behold, they're building a giant superpower sized nuclear arsenal. Russia has it. All the regimes, Iran wants the bomb. The Iranians want the bomb. All the bad guys, the socialist system countries, they all want weapons of mass destruction because destruction is embedded in their psychology. And this is what the, so you, you put together this movement, this socialist movement, you see the socialist regimes emerging. They all want these weapons. What are we headed for? We're headed for a potential mass destruction event or series of events. It seems to me, tell me where I have miscalculated here. Well, I wish I could tell you you've miscalculated. I wish I lived in a different world, but unfortunately it's really, for the most part, I agree with you. Uh, you know, with common people, I mean, like with capitalists, I think we both should correct our, both of ourselves and reiterate this point. Um, people are very diverse. As we pointed out, there are business people like Roger Robinson, for example, or Nick Hanauer, who's more of an FDR style capitalist. He's a multimillionaire, almost billionaire. He's probably a little more liberal or progressive for your tastes, but he's against the whole trickle down economics, which I oppose. And it seems like in some ways you do. Uh, so you have a lot of good people in the business community. And frankly, if I was setting up a government or you were setting up a government, I would recommend them. Because uh, you want good be business people in your policy making uh, committees and departments and whatnot, effective ones at the same time. And there are common people. Many common people do want to better themselves. They go to school, they play to by the rules. But are there ones that want something to nothing? Sure. They're just like there are tenants that, from what I have been, from what I understand, I haven't had any scientific studies, but it's reasonable to say that, look, there are tenants, for example, that who were, were earning money during COVID and they took advantage of the rent moratorium. Do I think that's the majority? No, clearly it was not. Do people like that exist? Yes. Is that good behavior? No, because as even our, our friend Tina Trent mentioned in a blog posting and a comment on, um, on uh, I think it might have been the City Journal website, you know, her type of conservatism is all about, amongst many other things, mutual loyalty between employee and employer. And I think we have to encourage a culture of mutual loyalty to each other. And the problem with conservatism, in my opinion, this started with Buckley. And I recommend to the audience that you look up a long forgotten conservative writer uh, and intellectual by the name of Peter Vierick. And he got basically thrown out of Buckley's movement to some degree uh, because he questioned conservatism very much in a similar tone in some ways that you have, Jeff, and I have, uh, you know, and I encourage people to look him up uh, because one Buckley basically which was not unusual for American history, but what happened with Buckley was is he created something that's been called fusionism. Radical libertarian economics, social traditionalism, and strong national security. And people like Michael Lind and Julius Krein, who is the editor of American Affairs, who was also involved in the hedge fund industry and really saw it up close and personal, and started an American Affairs Journal, which was politically independent, very much along my thinking in many ways, and to some degree yours. Um, you can't, that's an intellectually inconsistent formula. You can't have strong families within, and yet 
per pound what I view as radical libertarian economics of free trade and total deregulation and emboldening bad behavior and business and calling it, quote, the free market. You can't have a total. Well, you, can't, you can't call it conservative because you're not exactly, serving you anything. It's actually rather radical. Um, see, the, 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 again, and it doesn't address the key problem of the relationship of the business class and the powerful uh, financial interests with the political class. You, you have a weak political class that is, uh, to get elected to office, need a lot of money. So they need business to support them. So this is it has a corrupting influence both on business and on politics, and it 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 as I said before, uh, uh, a very interesting uh, Jacob Burkhardt, the famous cultural historian, kind of made cultural history a thing uh, back in the 19th century. I think he died around 1900. Um, Jacob Burkhardt had this um, description of of the elements that make up civilization. Civilization has church, state, and culture. If the church is overpowering in the society, you have a theocracy, which tramples down the market, the, the culture, that tramples down um, the political class and is, is destructive to society as a whole. Uh, if you have, um, uh, then the state becomes too powerful in, within the culture. The, the state tramples the church and makes the church into an instrument of the state. And the church can't perform its spiritualizing function. And it tramples down the market. It tramples down the culture. It restricts freedom of thought and, and so on. But this was Burkhardt's key insight. What happens if culture becomes too predominant in, in society? If the, if, the, if the culture becomes too predominant, the main power of culture is money and and the people and the businesses that support it. And what they do is then they destroy the spiritualizing function of the church, just becomes the Jesus business. And then you have the state. The state then becomes merely an extension of the business class. And so the state no longer performs its function of defending society. And this is what Burkhart feared was the he, he didn't really use this term, but I'll use it. It's kind of you can derive it from his writings, the American the American disease, which he saw overtaking Europe in the breakdown of Europe's aristocratic institutions, which he saw happening in the late nineteenth century. And you see that that is um, there is no more Iron Duke. That 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 has this and see what you had to have a stable warrior aristocratic class. You needed a stable class in ownership of land. People that could keep the land in their family for generations and raise their children to be little aristocrats who would go out there and, and sit out there on the hill and get shot off their horses because their leaders of armies were the leaders who stood out front of the armies and the bullets whizzed by them, like what happened to George Washington. That is, they were a leader in the sense the leader is the first one to take the shot, right? And exactly. you had these sons, you looked at all these aristocratic families, they'd have several sons and half of them dead from, you know, in wars. So, so you have these, and these are proud traditions. This, this class being gone, you only have these rich. Well, this Bill Buckley model that you were talking about, which is, you know, free market capitalism and some kind of conservative traditionalism socially, you know, is and strong national security. And strong national security is, a, is, as you say, is a contradiction in terms, because the different elements here is as soon as Buckley, as soon as the Soviet Union was defeated, it flew apart. Look at what happened to conservatism after the fall of the Soviet Union. And it's that's what splintered. I want to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go it, ahead now. For today's Explain issue. Splintering. Yeah, yeah, because I want to talk about, and one of the reasons why I relaunched this podcast and. Jeff, as long as both of our time's available, I'd like to have the honor of having you on a weekly basis because I'm very discouraged what I see on your site, not what you're writing, but some of the commenters who are, quote, on the right uh, or a shade of the right, so to speak. What I 
see in the internal discussion group that Je um, that Trevor Loudon has uh, invited us to, where we participate, the Conservatives for Ukraine Facebook page, closed discussion group. Just what I see in general from Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Congresswoman from uh, Georgia, or Matt Gates down here in Florida, another congressman, where you have uh, individuals that really lean towards the Russians. I'm not going to mention other names because these are some people that you and I have interacted with. Uh, one gentleman in particular was very knowledgeable. And you have this extraordinary naivete about Russia and also just, I think, in some cases, intellectual dishonesty. They know our arguments. In one case, you and I, I laid out so much information that how can you not slightly modify your positions with all of the information that I've laid out? I'm not saying I'm right 100%, believe me, I'm not. But there's so much out there that really begs more question asking and more reflection. And, hmm, wait a minute. What you and I are saying, we're not want to go to war with Russia. Yes, you have people like Lindsey Graham and other politicians, Chris Christie, and others that give us a bad name with their very foolish statements. These are politicians that are not clearly not individuals that would take the first bullets, particularly Congress uh, Senator Lindsey Graham. And well, my well, it, it, let me just make a comment. I, I. <laughs> Chris Christie shocked me in the 2016 campaign when he said mm -hmm. that he would put, you know, a no fly zone over Syria or something of that nature. Yes. If I remember correctly. And it's like that would be like Russia putting a no fly zone over the Baltic states or, so, you know, it, it, it's completely. Whoa, 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 Jeff, are you? I thought you were a warmonger. OK, we better yeah. clip this. And show it to your detractors saying you want war. See, I'm go a ahead. warmonger. Go, see, the thing ahead. is, is that there are, see, I don't agree with the people who believe in spheres of influence and make those arguments. But I, but the, the fact is there are countries you are by treaty allied with, like Syria has a tr mutual defense pact with Russia. If we imposed a, uh, a no-fly zone over Syria, that violation, that would be an act of war on Syria, an ally of Russia. So that is like, why do you want to, that is actually provoking a war with Russia. Now sending weapons to help defend Ukraine, even though the Russians are upset, that's not violating any a treaty or agreement. That's not even attacking Russia or one of its allies. Well, they violated the Budapest Memorandum they, they, Right, and we actually have a certain responsibility under the Budapest Memorandum because Britain and the US signed that uh, we were party to this agreement, which in which Russia promised uh, to observe Ukraine's sovereignty. And we really didn't do very much for Ukraine when Crimea was uh, annexed. But but you see, the, the, the problem with these these people uh, and, and you, you mentioned uh, what is her name? Marjorie Taylor Greene. Is that her name? Yes. And, and Matt Gates. Uh, and and there are many others. Matt too. Gates. See, the, the thing that that troubles me is that and I, I don't know about Gates, but I know about Green, uh, is that um, conspiracy theories are not a substitute for principled anti-communism and, and philosophic and sociologic understanding. The fact is, is that conspiracy theory is generally an attempt to reach clarity by people who have no background in politics, social science, or history. So they are trying to, on the fly, understand everything in terms of a very primitive way of, of making good guys and bad guys out of particular situations. And, and they, they create this, these simplistic structures. This, it's like a lens they've constructed, and, and it is a kind of ideology. Conspiracy theory itself is an ideology, uh, and that is it's a reductionism. It's a simplification of reality. And it falsifies reality as it attempts to understand it. But because it's simple and because it's accessible and because you can weave all these make-believe narratives, you can actually, you know, one of the key, one of the key things they do, for example, is if, a, if somebody has profited by an action, then they're the cause of the action, mm. right? I mean, my goodness, that means that if I invest 
in a company and it actually makes money and I profit by it, then I cause that company to make money. You know, I mean, this is a faulty reasoning. So they'll say like a very typical one. There's a guy, he's called the um, the dark journalist, right? And he talks about UFOs a lot and so on. I heard him the other day, the, the proof that Kennedy was, he believes Kennedy was assassinated by the aerospace industry. You know, by well, uh, Howard Hughes. One. I've never and, heard that one before. Right, it's a new one. It's one of these new ones. And of course, his proof is that all these aerospace companies got rich after Kennedy was assassinated, right? Well, if everybody that got rich after Kennedy was assassinated proves that they is proof that they killed Kennedy, there's an awful lot of people that got rich that were involved, right? You've got the Dili Lama under Dili Plaza, you know, with a firing squad lined up of all the people that are going to profit by this. So, so conspiracy theory becomes a reductio ad absurdum. It becomes a, a, an absurdity because the, the people who come up with it, you know, I mean, there's things I agree with with Marjorie Taylor Greene, but, but it, when you use this as your methodology, you're going to come up with horrific analysis. And, and completely wrong ideas of what's going on in the present. And it's going to allow you to come to conclusions about Ukraine and about Russia that are completely insane. And by the way, as you know, Nevin, the Russians over the years have become experts at manipulating conspiracy theories to, to get people to promote narratives that they have created. You know, yeah. like, like the not Ukraine is a Nazi country. Yeah, which is yes, which is led by a president who's Jewish. What kind of country, Nazi country, would allow a, Jew a Jewish to president? And I know I'm going to get all <laughs> kinds of crap when I post this video from the anti-Ukraine, anti-NATO people. Um, you know, so I who listen to this program just like your blog. Um, you know, I am not, a, look, I, when it comes to Ukraine, I support the sovereignty of Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, I like, because the United States in many ways has become so weakened over the decades, economically, militarily, morally, um, you know, I am concerned about our level of commitment to Ukraine. And if Russia would use that as an attack, against the United States. But on the other hand, what I predict the Russians are doing strategizing is they're waiting for the presidential and next round of congressional investigations, just like the North Vietnamese and Indo-Chinese communists. And they're waiting for those elections. And just like the anti, so-called anti-war Democrats took a majority in both houses in Congress in the mid 1970s, the Russians are waiting for the pro-Russia, anti-Ukraine MAGA Republicans or part, a large part of the MAGA Republicans to take over both houses of Congress. And you already have Governor DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, and Donald Trump already taking in varying degrees, strong stands against Ukraine and a very um, not so hard line against Russia, let's to the point of allying with Russia in the case of Ramaswamy, uh, Mr. Ra Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, that concerns me. They're waiting for that. They're monitoring it. And once that aid is cut off, the rush you watch the russians are going to move in and the ukrainians potentially will collapse because Which will the, be a holocaust uh, uh, involving millions of deaths by the way well there are various russian political personalities that have literally called for a holocaust against the ukrainians yes absolutely even though That's they feel what, that the yeah. people are russians they do they have argued. I mean, I don't remember all the quotes. I've seen them. I apologize to you in the audience, but there have been some Russian commentators and, you know, they're arms of the state one way or another. And Russian uh, legislators in the Duma, some of them have openly said there are going to be purges. The post-war plans in Ukraine, it's not going to be a picnic. 
It's not going to be about peace and reconciliation, which you remember the North Vietnamese and the Khmer Rouge and the Pathet Lao all said, oh, we're going to reconcile. There's going to be national reconciliation. Well, what happened? There were massive purges. Khmer Rouge didn't even bother to hide it. The Pathet Lao and the North Vietnamese, they hid it very well. Yeah. But there are mass executions and and and, camps. and here That's when what's I going to happen with the Russians. And to me, yeah. the people that said that Russia is not our enemy and let's just go to the other extreme and just totally abandon Ukraine. Well, they're going to have blood on their hands. Yeah. And you see that that's the thing I. I, when I was young, I was 10 years old in 1968, watching the the Tet Offensive happen, in uh, watching the body count on on CBS. We always watched Walter Cronkite at dinner time. Uh, we had dinner at the six o'clock news hour. My mom always liked that, and so we always saw the news when we ate dinner at my house. And um, I I watched this as a as a young person as a as a child. I watched the anti-war movement. I watched them clamoring for peace. Hey hey LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? You know, and and the rest of it. And the thing is, is that the number of Americans died was this much. The number of Vietnamese and Cambodians and Laotians that died was this much. We were holding alive this whole society. We were keeping them alive and we had armed them and they were fighting so that no Americans were dying over there. They were doing all the fighting. We Vietnamized the war. That was Nixon's thing that he Vietnamized it. And what did we do? We elected this Congress. This is exactly right. In 1974 election, these, these leftists got in. They, that Congress started on January 1st, 1975. And the first thing they did is they defunded the army of the Republic of Vietnam that was defending all those people. And by April 1975, the armies of North Vietnam rumbled right in and they were out of ammunition and they were out of fuel. And those armies, modern armies will collapse when they the do North not have Vietnamese the ammunition. Knew it. In a book written by General Van Tien Dong, who led the campaign, the, uh, the PAVN, that was the official name of the North Vietnamese Army, the People's Army of Vietnam, into the South. He called it the South, he said the South Vietnamese waged, quote, a poor man's war because they ran out of, am well, they were running out of ammunition. Ammunition they still is had cool. ammunition. Yeah. You know what happened to that ammunition? It was incorporated into their military, which made them at the time one of the world's most numerically powerful militaries yeah. and also distributed M16s and AR15s and M79 grenade launchers, amongst other things, to guerrilla and terrorist groups all over the world, including in our doorstep in Latin America. Yeah. So that's what yeah. happened. No, it was a catastrophe, an unbelievable catastrophe for communism to conquer Cambodia and the Republic of Vietnam. So it was it was it was a disaster. And we we look, we prevented that disaster in South Korea. And you look at what a vibrant society South Korea is, what South Korea contributes to the world. And, and what an amazing people they are. That could have been South Vietnam. That could have been Cambodia. And, and so I had, these people fled, the boat people. I had, when that, those countries collapsed, we had at our dinner table a Cambodian family. He was a Cambodian Air Force colonel and his children and his wife. And they had nowhere to go. So our church put them up. We had them at our dinner table I don't know, one day a week, it was at other people. We we took care of this family. Um, and the thing is, there were many families that came here that needed help. You have the Hamong people who, many of them lived in Eureka, California, where I was living for many years. Uh, these were fierce warriors who fought the mm -hmm. communists, who were going to be exterminated if they didn't get out of there. You know, and many, many didn't. Were exterminated like, yeah. by yellow rain. I'm sure you know what yellow rain is or was. Well, yeah, it's a chemical weapon that the Soviets developed. And gave it to the Vietnamese and the Pathet Lao, and they sprayed it to destroy. There was a Hmong resistance group led by the late General Vang Pao, who it was just they used captured American aircraft and Soviet aircraft, and they sprayed it all over. 
and if I recall correctly, it would like burn and liquefy the skin. It would mm. eat away. It, yeah. it, it, it's you terrifying. Know, this is what we're dealing with. And my concern, with whatever side you are on the Ukraine war with Russia, you know that's going to happen with Russia. They're not going to just walk in and play patty cake and bake bake cakes and live happily ever after. There's going to be potentially a bloodbath. They're going to murder millions of people. Those who don't flee, who have fought Russia, are going to be persecuted, imprisoned. They're going to die. Their children are going to be taken away from them and so on. And this is this is to understand for anybody, and I get this all the time on talk radio, for anyone to be for Russia, you're an accessory after the fact to murder, you idiots. And these same people, the Russians, want to do that to you. They want to do that to America. They're doing it to Ukraine now. You're next. So, so well, Jeff, you've interviewed defectors. Uh, one in particular, the late Colonel Stanislav Lunev, who defected in 1992 uh, to the United States. Um, so tell me a little bit about him, because he is one of the very, very few defectors that have given specifics on the Russian war plans and Chinese, in the case of Colonel Luna, have war plans against the United States. So are they going to come over and give us bread and salt and, you know, uh, and, and we're going to like bake cakes for them and we're going to play volleyball and hang out in the beach or paddleboard? What's going to go on? Well, I mean, I, mean, I don't he, want to be humorous he, about it. But he told me the last time he was at a meeting of the Russian general staff after the fall of the Soviet Union, this is in early 1992, before he defected, he defected in March of 92. Uh, they said, look here, the future nuclear war against America is still on. We're still preparing for that. He said the... the um, but but now our army shrunk. China is going to provide the invasion force for the lower 48 states. We're going to invade Alaska and Canada. We're going to get, as part of our benefit from the invasion, Alaska and parts of Canada. And China is going to get the lower 48 states. With other countries, he said, will be invited into the United States for looting rights. So other countries that help them are going to get to loot things out of here. Now, you have uh, a few years after Lunev told me this, Lunev told me this in uh, February of 1999. I had met him in August of 98 the first time, and I had many meetings and chances and phone calls and, 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 and meetings with him. He, um, a, so a few years later, Chiao Chen, the defense minister of China, makes this secret speech, which basically confirms Everything that Lunev had told me, that indeed they'd made a deal with the Russians, giving the Russians territory in the north to get what they wanted in the south, which was the lower 48 states. We reserved the, these states for uh, to make a second China. So he was saying, we're going, to, we're going to exterminate the population of the lower 48 states and build this and move hundreds of millions of Chinese into the lower 48 states to make a second China. And he talked about the, the most efficient way to kill people was a biological weapon, right? So, and then you've got people like um, Dr. Uh, Li Mengyan, the defect, defector who was a biologist, a microbiologist, or um, uh, uh, she has come forth saying they have made in China, they, they like viral weapons, and they've got much worse viral weapons than the one that got unleashed on us in 2020, the, the COVID thing. They have worse ones that they could use as weapons of war to attack us with. And, and goodness knows what the, uh, what the secrets behind many of their plans to attack us are. And of course, they're building this nuclear arsenal. So it could be that they've decided biological weapons aren't gonna do the job, they're gonna need nuclear ones, um, you know, clean nuclear weapons. So, you know, I, I don't think people here understand what's at stake, both in Taiwan and in Ukraine. They don't understand that if Russia wins in Ukraine, NATO could collapse. 
they could start using nuclear weapons, then they would be past this. See, they're very, Russia's very vulnerable with Ukraine right up next to the guts of their country. And, and they can't effectively wage a war where their own cities are so close. I mean, the minute, and they can't use nukes against the Ukrainians, against their Slavic brothers. They've got, they have to reserve their nukes for guess who? Us. We're the ones, if they're going to use nukes, they have to use them on us first. And of course, you know, Nevin, you've, you've written, I've got your book here. I've got a number of your books here, but you have this Red Dawn in retrospect. This is, mm. this is one of your books, which goes yes. into all of these plans that they cooked up, which is just, it's just mind boggling, uh, but it's the truth. And this is what Lunev had told me is like, they're very dangerous. These people are very dangerous enemies of, of, of ourselves. To the, we're talking about the not just, oh, well, it's a war, you know. No, it's you, your extermination we're talking about. Well, when you look at Dmitry Medvedev, what he said recently, a few years back, uh, he said that Russian policy is to create a Eurasian Union from Vladivostok all the way to Lisbon. Mm. So clearly, the Soviet strategy, which included Gorbachev's strategy to evict the United States from Europe and to hug, NATO, hug the United States to death out of NATO, to quote Gorbachev era documents, is continued. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, literally and, continued. And you know that this and, grandiose... And Medvedev's quote helps confirm that. And, and the, the Russians are using political warfare and subversion to accomplish that by using right-wing populists, elements of neo-fascist parties, as well as portions of the European Communist parties and certain hardline splinter groups of various European Communist parties. You had yeah. Die Linke, which was the, in Germany, which was the successor to the old East German SED, the Socialist Unity Party, Socialite Einheitspartei Deutschland. You have, um, Jody Brars uh, and uh, Harpo Brars, um, Communist Party, Marxist-Leninist of Great Britain, very hardline party. I, I listen to these communists. I, I do. I listen to the Brars. I listen to Maupin. Occasionally, I listen to the CPUSA uh, and other splinter parties. And it's very I, interesting what they it's say fascinating about this. stuff. It's interesting what they say about the war in Ukraine. Oh, I could tell you. They yeah. what. Okay, now in the United States, the Caleb Maupin Center for Political Innovation USA and the CPUSA Splinter Group Party of Communists USA, they outrightly support Russia. The other parties like PSL, CPUSA, Workers World Party, even Democratic Socialists of America, they'll in varying degrees slap Russia on the, whip, on the wrist in one sentence. But if you notice, they'll have paragraphs, not sentences, paragraphs condemning NATO and the United States as imperialist powers mm -hmm. and saying that we help provoke it, rightly or wrongly. So if you notice the volume of their criticism, you have to wonder in some cases, is that just kind of being politically correct and politically clever? And doing wink, wink. Well, you know, we want to appear yeah. effective, you but see, in reality, yeah. we really are not sympathetic to Ukraine, and we're not balanced. And in their minds, it wouldn't be so bad if Russia smashed NATO. Right. Well, Ukraine. see, this is the 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 delicate balance. That's what the, they say. The the that, communist that, movement encompasses the left in such a way that many people on the left, the soft left, the middle left, sympathize with Ukraine, and they can't alienate those people. You know, this, this invasion of Russia, of Ukraine, is so obviously wrong and horrific that they don't want to lose their constituency. And they have also, the Democratic Party has made the, the strategy of accusing Trump of, and the right of being the Russian puppets, and that they are the supporters of Russia's enemies. So mm -hmm. this has put them in a pe peculiar position 
which is very confusing to most uh, conservatives. Most conservatives cannot understand the doublespeak of the communists and the use of contradictions by the communists and the scissors strategy and controlled opposition. So they don't even know the the far right don't even understand how they're being manipulated by Russia. They just don't understand it. Yeah, no, and I think the Trump-Russia collusion, and, and that's a very complicated issue given, but that... I trace that episode as antagonizing a lot of conservatives and libertarians away from our position of being understandably concerned about Russia. And I think because it was all about Trump, their hero, Trump, their God Emperor Trump, being tarnished with the Russian connection. And if the Democrats, all of a sudden, many of whom were criticizing Russia, some did before Trump, um, but many felt that, you know, supported Obama's reset with the, uh, with the Russians. And then mysteriously, all of a sudden, Russia's the bad guy, and they were going against their hero emperor Trump. They're like, oh my God, maybe Russia isn't so bad. And maybe Michael Savage and maybe Pat Buchanan and others were correct that Russia is a Christian country, is a nationalist country, has no connection with the Soviet co- political culture, or even economic culture, and whatnot. Right. So, and I think that was the turning point. So, before you had certain personalities and commentators like Michael Savage and Patrick Buchanan that leaned towards Russia. Alex Jones was another one, although he zigzags inexplicably. He had you on his program, which I was shocked. But yeah. then maybe scarcely not even a year ago, he was very pro-Russia since Russia's attack on the Republic of Georgia back in 2008. And then before that, he was sounding like Galitzin and you and Trevor Loudon and Cliff Kincaid and me and some elements in World Net Daily and Newsmax, et cetera, et cetera. And being Putin is a communist and China's building missiles. And then he switched with Russia in 2008, Michael Savage was very similar too. He used to have our mutual friend Jimmy from Brooklyn on his show until he, I'm sorry to use profanity, but I heard the broadcast and I never really listened too much to Michael Savage afterwards because I lost respect for him. Mm-hmm. He shit all over him. One call, I heard it live. Yeah. Was, I mean, he, and I heard a interview with Jimmy from Brooklyn afterwards on a radio program, 48 hours, and you could tell he was shaken. Uh, oh, yeah, Jimmy was that. very hurt by that. And of course, I used to, I first heard Jimmy on Michael Savage's show. That's the first time I heard Jimmy on there. And of course, Jimmy is a guy who, who, who basically infiltrated the Communist Party USA, figured out all of the things that we understand about the, the fake collapse of communism. He've had multiple fake collapses, uh, Jimmy will tell you. And of course, he's got pictures of himself, you know, being taken with uh, Gus Hall. You know, he's he really um, he really ran ran the gamut inside the Communist uh, Party. But you you have to go inside these organizations to understand that they have strategies and that they have deceptions that they are playing, that they they play out on us and that that Russia is supporting Cuba, uh, is supporting communist Nicaragua communist Venezuela, supporting all the communist regimes in Africa, uh, receiving military support from communist China and North Korea, are basically in an unlimited partnership with China. Um, for people to say, oh, well, we we pushed Russia into the arms of China. Um, no, I'm sorry. That's not true. We that's didn't. bollocks. What the British yeah. would term bollocks, yeah. that is bollocks because Many people have documented that the Russians have signed secret and not open treaties, intelligence, military agreements in 1992. In the mid-1990s, the Chinese were talking about, including with Russia, creating an anti-hegemonist front. You have, again, uh, the uh, there was a treaty of friendship between Russia and China, I believe, in 2001, which the George W. Bush administration downplayed. Uh, you know, you have uh, 
I recently was reading in a book uh, based on in part declassified Soviet era documents where you had the conception of military assistance passed by the Soviet Politburo in mid-1989. And uh, it was a strategic shift in policy, but one of the things that the Politburo decided in the wake of the conception of military for military assistance uh, in December 1989 to give the official approval to export arms to the People's Republic of China by the Soviet Union. Um, you know, so no, the Soviets were, uh, the, the, the Russians were not pushed into the arms by the Chinese. There were decades upon decades of treaties, of military cooperation, exports of goods, including capital goods, even during the Sino-Soviet split. I mean, there were many, many occasions where on the open diplomatic front, where the Soviets supported the Chinese position on key issues, like when Taiwan, the Republic of China, was kicked out of the UN in 1971, the Soviets UN mission supported them to the point of where they were like gathering and hanging out with each other physically. Yeah. And this was at the height of the split. Um, yeah. There was a document um, on Princeton University's Cold War International History Project. And I want to read it for the audience because it really gives a bird's eye view and why the scholars didn't jump on it is really kind of beyond me. I mean, because to me, this is a really, this is a big deal because it shows at bare minimum that yes, relations between ideological, um, kindred, ideologically kindred spirits, despite differences, yes, splits can happen in a millisecond, but they could also be easily healed too as well. So this is dated from the mid 1980s. This is a conversation between Eric Honecker, who is the now deceased dictator of East Germany, and Kim Il Sung, who is the now deceased dictator or was of North Korea, the DPRK. So Kim Il Sung, who met both with Soviet and Warsaw Pact and Chinese leaders. He said that given the complex world situation, I hope that the Soviet Union and China work things out. I believe that the development of relations with the US is not targeted against the Soviet Union. Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai already told me that when they established relations with the US, they told us every time they met with Japan and the US, the only objective of these relations, meaning with the US and Japan, is to obtain developed technology and credit from Japan and the US. It's a lot of things being said. Okay, we're, we're one, not only do we want to work things out with Russia and China, but then they're also saying at the same time that China really didn't really want to establish relations with the US and Japan, which they had relations with Japan, trade relations since the founding of the PRC, by the way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's showing their true motivation. Nothing about containing Soviet aggression. When you look at, um, okay, here's another one in 1977. Uh, when after, I don't want to read a bunch of these things, and this is new information in your audience. The audience needs to know this. Um, and I'll come to my point. When Chinese Foreign Minister Huang Huo in 1977 visited uh, the Soviet uh, Yugoslavia under Joseph Broz Tito, he said he admitted that while, quote, minor differences exist between our two nations, we still have a common goal. We do this to achieve our objectives. When you had a 1987 conversation with Deng Xiaoping, Bulgarian communist ruler Todor Zhivkov asserted that China and Bulgaria shared, quote, common aims and ideals. And in another meeting Dong, with the Bulgarians, Dong claimed that Bulgaria and China share a common aim. We must make efforts together. And you have a text of an informational note from the official visit of Poland of the Chinese foreign minister, Comrade Wu Zhu Qian from 1987 read in part one fundamental element which binds our countries in, is their political system and the common enemy. Well, I got more from the Soviets 
which is very weird, very, very weird, where they, with the Soviets were saying, we know why uh, the Chinese are establishing relationships. Okay, here we go. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry to do this. I get, like, Jimmy very excited about this stuff, so mm -hmm. it's like... You know, when you're on a roll, and the reason why I just feel so desperate because people are saying now we got to split Russia and China. Well, they are more aligned than not. That's the and, thing. And they and they we tried it before uh, when Kissinger went to China and then Nixon, and we ended up building up China, but it was it was a scam. We built up our enemy. And well, this here was, we go. This was it. We were. They understood what to say to fool us, and this is with the stupidity of our business community. I mean, Kyle Bass gave a beautiful. I don't know if you you've seen it. Kyle Bass gave a beautiful uh, presentation before the Hudson Institute a few days ago, mm -hmm. saying you got to get out of China. We we can't have investment in China. It's stupid. It's a bad place for Americans to park their money to invest because they're going to expropriate you. They've already passed the laws for taking all American property in China. And uh, so you invest in China, you're just going to lose. And uh, economically, to... the Russians have been doing that, too. They have been getting uh, very stringent also with uh, foreign investments. But you have American companies like Halliburton and Koch Industries. And the Kochs donate to ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Oh, and yeah. countless, you know, so the and, Koch and the Koch brothers, they were very big libertarian boosters. And this is the yeah, thing I... about the libertarians. The libertarians have been consistently duped. By the Russians. Yeah, I I, they're it, but they terrible. have been consistently duped by them. Yeah, well, I have I got my own opinion on the Koch brothers. I mean, they clearly know what's going on. They just don't care. As one of their former engineers had said in reference to Coke Coke Industries dealings with uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, they just said the Koch brothers, all they care about is profit, 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 profit. They don't care about national security, they don't care about how their policies that they push hurt average Americans. But I have more from the Soviets. This is a book based, um, this was uh, in a book, um, let's see, d -d 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 101, where is that? Oh, uh, Sergei Redchenko on want, unwanted visionaries, the Soviet failure in Asia at the end of the Cold War. And this is interesting. What the Soviets said on October 2nd, 1980, the Soviet Politburo, read between the lines, Jeff, and the audience, issued a resolution which pinpointed the real goal of American cooperation with China. These are my notes here. Being realistic, one should recognize that a, quote, strong China will probably choose a different direction for its expansionist plans. It will swallow neighboring countries, take hold over regions vital for the entire world, and will not serve as an instrument in the hands of the USA or some other countries. Uh, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko said of the West cooperation with China, you may be in a euphoric mood now about China, but the time will come when you will all be shedding tears. And then Soviet Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Kapitsa, and I'm going to read a follow-up quote by a defector from the People's Republic of Kampuchea, which Cambodia under the Vietnamese control said about this. Kapitsa claimed that China's alignment with the United States uh, was temporary because Beijing wished to, quote, modernize their economy using Western technological help and credits and have no cut, no other capital to pay for this help but anti-Sovietism. I mean, do you see a pattern here? Yeah, because, because people who think this is the problem with an, a totally economic view of things. Man is, does not live by bread alone. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that getting rich and making a lot of money does not solve all your problems. In fact, making money and getting rich with communists creates new problem for you. The communists are going to use that to destroy you. They're going to use that to infiltrate your system. They're going to have access to your capital markets. They're going to infiltrate your corporations and your government. And then they're going to bring your system down. Because now they've learned all your tricks, they have been your partners in business, and now they're going to use it to hang you. As as Carl Raddick uh, asked uh, 
uh, Lenin at one point, where are we going to get a rope big enough to hang the whole world bourgeoisie? And Lenin said, they will, they will sell it to us themselves. Because Lenin had lived in the West. He understood how capitalism worked. He understood how they thought. They will sell it to them themselves. It's even worse than that. We'll loan them the money to buy it. So they don't even have to come up with the money to buy the rope to hang us all. We'll give them the money and the expectation that we're going to make profits further down the line. So this is the, the problem with the capitalist system as I see it. And it, it is because there are higher considerations than money making. There are, in terms of philosophy, in terms of spirituality, there are higher considerations. And survival of a country is one of those higher considerations. But also the right and wrong of allowing people to be massacred in other parts of the world, to be wholesale slaughtered by a regime that's coming for us next. It's just like Winston Churchill's famous saying that appeasement is the, the idea that the that if you feed the crocodile other people, he will eat you last. Yep, and I wanna, yeah, and I wanted to, I found this, and I'm gonna address your point um, on that, because I think that's very uh, accurate what you said, unfortunately. So to remember, I was talking about the ex-Soviet foreign minister, deputy foreign minister, Kubica. Well, this defecting People's Republic of Kampuchea, which was a Vietnamese-controlled communist puppet government during most of the 1980s and early 1990s. And by the way, they have tremendous influence still. They're one of the major parties in Cambodia right now. It's now called the Cambodian People's Party uh, under Hun Sen, amongst other ex-Khmer Rouge leader and Vietnamese-allied communists. Uh, so this defecting Kampuchean diplomat Chin Sun An reported the national reconciliation of the Phnom Penh government, that's the capital of Cambodia, by the way, for those who don't know, did not come from the goodwill of Hanoi, it's the capital of Vietnam, and Phnom Penh. It was the result of Soviet pressure. Soviet Deputy Foreign Minister Kapitza once told the Phnom Penh government that it should talk with the Khmer Rouge so that the USSR could reduce Chinese-Soviet tension and isolate the USA. This was in 1989 this was occurring, right when Gorbachev was meeting Deng, and they promised the United States that it was not directed against third countries, which on other times they other, indicated- Other they media, was, yeah, sure. Yeah, which on other occasions they said they would be creating a new world political order as a result where they would say on other occasions, right. not too often. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. What does this show? It shows you can't trust expansionist, fascist, or communist countries. Right. And it is enraging me, and this is why I want to get people like you and Trevor Loudon and others back on this program and get this back and running because it really deeply concerns me that you have individuals who should know better who are quote unquote conservatives or pro freedom libertarians, whatever you want to call them. They're saying, oh, we pushed Russia into the hands of China and we got to split Russia and China apart. We have we learned? Maybe I should give free copies of my book to them, but you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna, gonna throw it in the trash. Yeah, you know they're not gonna read it. I had, I had, yeah, they're not gonna read it. I mean, no. um, you know, so this is, this is, I well, mean. Well, I, I can tell you that what I get from people when I mention this, when I produce evidence and arguments, I get uh, outraged reactions from these people. I had a, this guy, uh, Charlie, he always calls into the, to the John Moore show. And, uh, you know, he, he called in, he was just incensed that I would not agree that the, that the regime in, in Ukraine was bad and that, that they were, uh, he made the claim that they were kidnapping young people off the street and forcing them into the army the way they do in Russia, actually. And that it was the fascist regime in Ukraine and that it was deserving of being cut off and when I disagreed and said he was spotting Russian propaganda, he just flipped out. But they are so committed to the deception that they have been sold. And that's part of selling the deception. Deceived people believe it. Oh, do they believe it. 
and there's no taking it away from them. No, and here's a and a, your point about business people. Uh, Saul Alinsky, famous uh, revolutionary activist and intellectual from about what the 1940s until the 1960s, and he's a mentor to a number of uh, people on the left, including basically communists. Um, unfortunately, um, you know you have various interest groups that have quoted him as a. Uh, as uh, a hero, uh, the NEA, and look, I'm for teachers being represented in unions because there is a power imbalances between employers and employees. But where I draw the line is when you have uh, union groups that uh, utilize ideology to achieve ulterior motives, I would argue. And they, when World That Daily pointed it out, uh, they washed their website. I saw that personally with another website too as well, a similar uh, public interest group with legitimate goals and aspirations, they um, indicated their love for Alinsky and I saw that eventually wash from their website. So anyway, Saul Alinsky, which Glenn Beck never does this quote, by the way, probably for we reasons we can guess because he's a radical libertarian economically and a radical free trader. Saul Alinsky, the veteran theorist and left-wing agitator, wrote in it, Rules for Radicals. And this says a lot about the socialist extremists as well as big business people, the personalities involved. Right. As for businessmen, I could persuade a capitalist on Friday to bankroll a revolution on Saturday that will bring him a profit on Sunday, even though he will be executed on Monday. You don't need conspiracy theories to explain this. No. That no. one sentence says it all. Yes, it does. It's brilliant. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a brilliant I don't like quote. It, but yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah, I've heard that quote uh, before, and it's, it's kind of a famous one. Uh, and it, it again, it aligns exactly with what Ma was saying in the NN way, in the book, The NN Way. Um, uh, it, 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 it is the, 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 the pattern of communism is to use capitalism to come to power. And, and this is where the conspiracy theory people get it wrong. They think it's the capitalists have created communism to pauperize everybody. But no, I'm sorry, if the capitalists wanted to pauperize you, they could derail their own system so easily you'd be pauperized before you could say the word pauperize. They would just collapse their own markets if they wanted us all to be living in caves. No, they they don't. They want to keep the money system true. And see, here's the thing, uh, Nevin: the, uh, capitalism works. It creates wealth. It creates it the good things that we live with. So I don't want to vilify the capitalists because they perform a function. But the function of of giving people a comfortable life, I'm sorry to say, you value your comfortable life. It's an inferior function to what is right and wrong. And what is noble and w whether you survive, whether you're executed on Monday, right? You're going to be comfortable until you're executed, but you're going to be executed on Monday, right? Um, the thing is, is that we want to find uh, a, we want a capitalism that doesn't commit suicide and take us all with it. We want to find a form of capitalism that actually has some kind of checks and balances on the on the capitalist propensity to put money making first and not the other things that make a society a whole society it's not just about money sorry right. money's yeah. important yeah. i don't want to say it's not we all like our comforts but we can have our comforts without committing suicide if we have a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of checks and balances yeah, and, and, you know, that's why I've come to become a political atheist, uh, to quote one of, and he also likes your your show, too, as well, and your writings. It's uh, some uh, gentleman from Mississippi, and he says that, you know, I'm a political atheist, or I call myself political homeless, and he's looking forward, he said, to our interview. And that's why, because you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. No. There no. is good. I think unions serve an important purpose. I think capitalism is very important. It's probably with the proper checks and balances and laws to keep it in check. It's clearly the best system. Uh, different 
there are different flavors of capitalism and you have to look at also what works for our population well yeah works for human nature and, you, and liberal this general liberal um philosophy liberalism classical liberalism which is the idea that that, that there, there's this freedom free market free speech free everything uh yes this is very important freedom is very important but it's freedom with responsibility mm -hmm. and all there's no such thing as an unlimited irresponsible freedom it just does not exist it, the minute it exists it destroys itself and it is as we are uh i think it's very true what you know as objectionable as his philosophy otherwise was um uh, the author of um, the concept of the political, Carl oh, um, Schmidt. Carl Schmidt. Carl Schmidt, Carl Schmidt uh, basically said, "Look, every society, every community, has is 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 a whole and has enemies, and you're never going to get rid of enmity. There are communities that are essentially against each other. They have different religion, they don't agree on many things. The only way to resolve their agreements, oftentimes, is war. This is just a reality of life." And the thing is, is that when you realize that, you know, one of the ideas of liberalism or, or libertarians is that there are no real conflicts between people because we can turn everything into a win-win, right? We can get rid of enmity because we can all participate in the market and we can all get rich. Well, that is a, like, a, like a socialist utopia. That is not reality. There is no such reality as a universal society where everyone is just trying to get rich. And everyone is getting rich. That doesn't exist, and it's it's impossible to create it. And I I just got to underscore this. This is libertarian utopianism, the same as socialist utopianism. It doesn't exist. It will never exist. It cannot exist. I'm sorry. You have enemies, and the thing is, is that when you go into business with your enemies, there's a special word for that. It's called treason, because you are now betraying your larger society to make money in partnership with your country's enemy. And the only word treason, which has been taken out of our vocabulary, we have not executed anybody for treason in this country since the Rosenbergs. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's correct. And that is a very funny situation for a country because I don't think in the Soviet Union they stopped executing people ever or under the Russian Federation they've stopped executing them. Or in China, I know certainly China is executing them by the dozens every day. So the fact of the matter is, is that we have enemies. We won't acknowledge them because we want to make money in partnership with them. But then what happens is we destroy our own society. I'm sorry, but that is treason. And one day when this country, when our cities are in are burning, when our economy is collapsed, when tens of millions of Americans are dead. And that will be too late, I'm sorry. But then when the country wakes up, I'm sorry, but you all better flee to China. You all business people that, that invested in them and built them up, you all better flee to Havana. Because you know what? I, I'm not a judge and I'm not a jury. I'm not going to judge you. But the people in this country, they're going to be ready for hangings. Well, and this is why, honestly, we need to have these shows to educate people, to write our pieces, to chronicle the history, because you need evidence and you people, we want to sow the seeds, spread the seeds so people out there are aware of really what's going on, that much of the conservative, so-called conservative media, the libertarian media, doesn't cover large swaths of the wet left will not cover certainly not the tankies the marks the hardline marxist leninists because they're the ones that want to despoil the united states uh and most of your established most of the republicans and democrats there are, are some exceptions here and there but they're also not consistent and they can't be trusted because the republicans will come in and i used to be a republican i bounce back and forth between both parties to vote in primaries and what I find with the Republicans is the yes, they'll take some very good measures. They'll at times uh, they'll say the right things. But in many cases, it's like what's gone on since COVID. And obviously, there are certain subjects we can't talk about because YouTube has struck my channel left and right. I think there are people that don't like what I have to say. 
that's fine. It is what it is, I guess. I can't control that. But um, you look at it in the wake of COVID. And you had a few outlier Republicans like Josh Hawley, whether you met her or not, and Bernie Sanders, the independent and the supposed socialist uh, from Vermont, although the actual Marxist-Leninists actually hate, hate him uh, these days, or for decades actually. Um, they came together to warn and try and push efforts to reshore our pharmaceutical production and our medical supply production. Did any, Mitch McConnell do anything about it at the time? No. Did Trump take the airwaves and Twitter to like push Congress to do that? No. And I'm sorry. I, I, I used to be a politically active Republican, very active. At Lieutenant Colonel Allen West I worked for. I did work online for Trump trying to promote him. Uh, I have voted Republican since 1992. I proudly voted at the time for George Herbert Walker Bush. I bought it all. But when you really look at brass tacks, when you hear the stories, your stories of interfacing with so-called conservatives and others, me, and I could tell you stories in the audience, which I have, it's just, which is more limited compared to you. Uh, to me, it's, you need you really need a new ethic of leadership and i think you've been right all along about that jeff uh there was an essay written by sam francis about james burnham which i recently reread and where james burnham said the new leaders would come from is the everyday people he traveled the country in the 1960s he thought that business people would be the true leaders and then of course he wrote a book called i think it was a booklet called the suicide uh, not the suicide of the west but yeah that was, was the, that was the book he wrote not, a book. not not suicide of the west but it was something else and it was written in about 1950 where he realized that the business community would not rescue us they're not oh, going to be the managerial the revolution no um oh let me uh hold on hold on um are you talking about some... the machiavellians I'm talking about no, it, it, it's not but, as well known. Let me. Burnham wrote the Suicide of the West in the 60s. Yeah, no, this was another one. Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, oh, geez. Uh, hold on. Oh, my goodness. Well, Burnham uh, had been a Trotskyite. Yes, he was. Um, um, and he realized, of course, what communism was. He was very influential on uh, Buckley, by the way. He yeah, and ironically, not he was not a free market orthodoxy kind of person, unlike a, a radical libertarian like uh, Buckley was, because uh, he support he he said uh, in a response to opposition to the supersonic transport project uh, pro plane project, um, which he supported amongst other things, and he said that you know look he presumes to be in favor of the free market minus the von Miesian uh, abstractions as he turned it. There's a rich tradition with conservatives where there are differing shades of conservatives, and those are the types of people I, that I tend to align myself, I guess, with. Um, let me, let me see. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, it's like the challenge of communism. Um, why is this not? Uh, I'm so sorry. You know, this always happens. It's like when you're trying to find something, it's like um, it's like you can't find it. Uh, yeah. Well, it's it's the the anyway. Our in our discussion. We've ranged wildly over what socialism is, and uh, I just one of my frustrations is that I will talk to somebody and they'll say, "Oh, China's not communist; they have private property." So they, and then I talked to I just saw a video. Someone sent me a video of a young guy doing a presentation that America is not capitalist; it's communist, right? Because <sighs> our system of private property is not perfectly according to the libertarian model of it right so you mm. hear you have this paradox you have you have people on the one hand saying that we're a communist country and china's not and you you're gonna you hear this i hear this on the right mm. more and more 
that we that that really they want to align with Russia and China, which have less economic freedom than we do, both in Russia and China. They want to align with those countries because they're the they're going to fight the new world order, right? Which they don't recognize the World Economic Forum and and so on as being you know Leninist communist front organizations working with Moscow and Beijing, which Klaus Schwab clearly is working with Beijing and Moscow, but they can't mm-hmm. see it. They can't see this. And, and so they, 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 they can't identify their enemy or their friend, and they can't properly describe themselves. You know, like um, Sun Tzu said, uh, you have to, in war, you have to know yourself and you have to know your enemy. Well, they misidentify their enemy as capitalist and themselves as communist. And they, that this is then, uh, and of course the problem is, as I had said before in the broadcast, is that social science reasons in ideal types. Yes. Socialism, democracy, capitalism, these are ideal types. There is no, real things in real life are more of a mixed bag. And they always are a mixed bag because those ideal types do not actually exist in reality. No, there they do no, not. There is no democracy that is really you know, that isn't, you know, as, as Robert Michels wrote in his book, Political Parties, democracy is, democracy is just another way of organizing oligarchy. And all these people get disillusioned and they go into, cons- it's a conspiracy against our democracy. No, it's because these concepts aren't, are sort of unreal. <laughs> yeah, so I found what I was looking for. It was a book by James Burnham, The Coming Defeat of Communism, published by Lightning Source Incorporated, published in 1950, pages 248 to 271. And there was a chapter called The Suicidal Mania of American Business. And I recommend the audience really read that because it was really correct. And he goes against the right too as well and it it's just it's fascinating um on that um well, all human okay, beings the, the right Trump. is human and so all human beings can be subjected to criticism yeah you know. he said but it's very true In this case, in the struggle against internal communism, these negative qualities of the American businessmen are discouragingly apparent. Some of the businessmen, plain and simple reactionaries, are absolutely anti-union, which we face today. Very much so. They would like literally to smash the trade unions. And at the same time, those same ones, half of them, like the Coke Industries, they'll do business with their own gravediggers. Um, since their likes become known, they too help to alienate the proletariat and to heap up grist for the communist propaganda mill. Others, from ignorance or greed or both, act toward to unions in such a way as to aid communist-led unions against anti-communist unions. And I hate to say it, there is a communist element in today's uh, labor union movement. This- oh, it's very strong now. They've taken over a lot of the biggest labor unions, basically. So I think Burnham is correct, and I urge this is what the conspiracy theorists who criticize, quote, the insiders or the multinationals, the bankers. To me, what I just read about Burnham, and there's a lot other that you can read, and he's not anti-capitalist per se. He doesn't want to eliminate business, private business and industry at that point in his life because he left Trotskyism back in, I think, by about the early 1940s. And there were several reasons why he left communism and he was active in the Socialist Workers' Party. (coughs) And there are varying reasons. And I recommend people read penetrating critiques like James Burnham. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, there's many shades of opinion and that have to be taken into account. Everything is, reality is much more complicated than some ideological meme. Yeah. And that is the problem. And and so we we can't have cartoon thinking unless we want to become ourselves cartoon like <laughs> unless exactly. we want to be self caricatures, which a lot of people, their politics, you know, you, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is sort of a self caricature. Yeah, I mean, a look, there are going to be things I agree with the Republican Party. Same with you. Other things I might agree with the Democratic Party and maybe perhaps you as well. And I just look at it and I say, my goal is, is, I know it sounds like a bit of a cliche, is to build a better country and to protect it. 
And I think sometimes we have to take stock of our own problems. And while we can't have a perfect world, we certainly can have a better defended country. We can have a more prosperous country. Never... you're never going to have ultimate equality ever. There's never well, been. Well, you're a never going to have a country like where that. where you eliminate all injustice and everything works perfectly and no it's one impossible. ever gets hurt. It's you impossible. Know, tra- tragedy is part of life. We're all going to get hurt or die in our lifetime. Exactly. Uh, this is this is it. But you you know it's the dignity and the right and wrong of it that that should be first and foremost, and the truth of it. Exactly. I mean, yeah. well, I mean, this has been a productive uh, conversation. I appreciate the interview. Uh, we definitely like to try and do this once a week. Uh, Want to do it on Fridays? We can do this every Friday, maybe. Uh, it would have to be either Friday during the day when I'm off and or Friday nights uh, when I'm working uh, 10 to 6. So we can do that. Uh, we'll work it out. But there's just so much going on in the world today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm just very deeply disturbed by the direction of a lot of Republicans who should know better. Uh, it all started with Trump, I think, being accused of being an asset for the Russians. Yes, the history of his business connections with the Russians, I get it and whatnot. But the Democrats, in my opinion, right or wrong, were playing opportunistic politics because many of those same Democrats, other than maybe three like Sheldon Whitehouse and Bernie Sanders, they all voted to give Putin permanent normal trade relations with the mm-hmm. Russians. Yeah, that's um, right. You know, we, uh, you know, many Democrats uh, supported the um, the START treaty, the new START treaty under Obama, with certain exceptions. Um, so, yeah, the thing is just absolutely, um, you know, it's just really, really disturbing the whole situation and. I have to get back into the fray, and I know you and I, we give a lot of evidence, we give a lot of anecdotes, but people, I think of the vast majority of people, and it's not their fault, and I'm not picking on them, we are busy people, we have families and ourselves to support and responsibilities, but none of the news media is talking about this. Maybe some people no. on YouTube or online, but that's about it. This is stuff that you know is um, not politically popular to talk about. Well, the, the, the problem is we've had a dumbing down. And so people are using words. They think they know what they mean. And they don't really. They haven't really thought it through. And so that's how we get trapped in these false narratives. And that we end up wrecking our country. And screwing up our own uh, you know, foreign policy and our national pol- economic policy. So anyway, Nevin, yeah, it's been great. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. We look forward to having you again. We'll try and schedule regular weekly interviews as best as both of our schedules will allow. And um, yeah, well, thank you all for joining us on the program. Hopefully this YouTube won't chop up this video when I try to upload it um, because it's now two and a half hours. And uh, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today on the Politically Homeless podcast. And our first guest back on our rechristened program. And thank you again. God bless. Be safe. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. Take care. God bless the United States, too.